Hello everybody, thanks for watching my video. My name is Robert Movitt and this is the Nemo 200 underwater video camera housing. I've been making these for quite a while and I decided to put together a little video to show you how you can make them yourself. This is an interesting camera housing in that it uses almost entirely off-the-shelf materials. You can get most of this material in a hardware store or a plumbing supply house. There's only a couple of the items that you have to fabricate yourself. Um, I'll go over them. But let, let's go over the features of the housing. This is made with a, uh, uh, a seaboard or starboard material for the, the arms and for the top plate. It's a half inch thick. It's extremely wonderful material for a marine environment. Um, it uh, it won't, won't rot, rust, peel, delaminate. I, I, I recommend this highly. Also, if you drill your holes a little bit smaller than the bolts, the bolts are snug and, and you don't really even need any nuts. The, the main housing is from a six inch well casing. Uh, PVC. These are stainless steel latches uh, with the locking mechanism. This is a one and a quarter inch uh, PVC pipe with uh, with the caps painted. Stainless steel bolts. You have stainless steel screws going through the top. There is a fiberglass uh, mounting plate that I made uh, from a mold that I'll show you how to make that attaches this very securely. This is the lens cradle and it's also something I fabricated but it's very easy to do and it comes off easily this is a acrylic lens I left the paper on this is the front of the camera housing this is a little mounting board that slides in and out you can fit uh, many types of cameras you can make these as long or short as you want also this PVC pipe comes in different diameters so if you have a much larger camera you can use this design and make the same housing for a larger diameter and fit almost any camera that's made. Uh, this is inexpensive, uh, actually flimsy masonite and it's flimsy on purpose because if you're out in the field and you want to add your camera with a different hole you can make a hole with a little pen knife if you need to. But I've mounted, this works with a, a Canon UV or Canon uh, H, excuse me, a Canon Allura it works very well and these are just metal washers with uh, hot uh, glue and painted and it works very well I'll show you how to make the groove in, in your, your front in the back you're sealed permanently with polyurethane uh, sealant 12 stainless steel screws and a little piece of neoprene on the outside to give it a little cosmetic appeal like I said you can make almost all of these with with hand tools or, or minimum uh, machine tools like uh, you may need a router uh, and a jigsaw and a drill uh, basically that's about it and a handsaw and I'll show you how to make these Th this is this is very low cost the materials you could make retail most of these materials for everything is about sixty dollars so it's very low cost um, you can, like I said, use almost any camera in, in this design. Uh, you can go to 200 feet with this. Um, the uh, You're going to be using a, a well casing that you're going to be getting short pieces from a, a supply house or a plumber that has some excess left over. When I made these, I had to buy 20 foot sections of well pipe. It cost me several hundred dollars. Of course, I could make 20 or 30 housings from one piece but if you can get a scrap for free or you could offer the uh, the plumber or the supply house a few dollars a foot for just to get a few foot section that they have left over and if you have a three or four foot section you can make uh, three or four housing so once you set your jigs up to make your, your your housing once you've done that you've done most of your work so you can easily make several more and, and sell them to your, your your friends and dive buddies and recoup almost all your costs or, or actually more than your cost um, like I said, y you have the ability to make different sizes because the well casing comes in different sizes. And it's possible you could even go deeper if you wanted to reinforce the center with a, uh, uh, you could have a small steel pipe to go inside. But that, that's the, uh, the introduction to the Nemo 200. Uh, let's get started in showing you how to make the individual parts. How to make your, your lens cradle. 
To make your lens cradle, or at least one way to make your lens cradle, you can use a rubber mold. This material here is called <coughs> pour mold. Excuse me. This pour mold, it's mixed uh, one part to one part. It's, it's very easy to use. It's fairly inexpensive. And you end up with a rubber mold, something like this. Or exactly like this. <laughs> um, and in order to make this mold, I didn't make a box. I made a, a round enclosure with a, in a, a lightweight uh, sheet metal. And I had a, a round cart in the middle. To, and I saved on, on mold material instead of using a box. And when you're done, you pour your resin, your polyester uh, fiberglass resin in your mold, and you add um, chopped up fiberglass in very small pieces or strips and pour in your resin. And after it cures, you get something like this. Now this has black colorant added to it, so it normally looks like this. Now, in order to get this part, you have to make it. You have to have something like this to make a mold. And how that's done is I purchased a uh, very inexpensive wood lathe on eBay for about $90. It was a, called a mini wood lathe. And I took uh, two pieces of, or three pieces of uh, half inch pine and glued them together, made a circle, and then um, I put it on the wood lathe and just uh, laid out the center of, of the uh, the pine, took it off, cut this center, then I had a piece just like this, and put it into in a, a little box enclosure, and put some uh, clay on the outside edges and press it down, and, and uh, remove that clay with an exacto knife and putty knife, and it was inside an enclosure, and then I added the pour mold over the top, and when I was done, I ended up with something like this. This was inside. Then you take it out and you have a mold and then you can make as many of these lens cradles as you want. This will last a long time. The very first one I made was very big, very thick, and I realized later it was overkill because these lens cradles, they're only there for the purpose to hold the, the lens in until you go down a few feet and the water pressure takes over. If you go down far enough, you could actually take off your lens cradle, and your lens would be on uh, your, your housing from the water pressure alone. So that's how to make your mold. And like I said, if you don't want to use a, a wood lathe, it, it, it looks difficult, and it's not. Um, it, it's, it's very simple. If you can use a table saw, you can use a wood lathe. Um, I purchased, like I said, a small, inexpensive one, put it on the floor so it was uh, sturdy and didn't vibrate and I uh, was able to, to make uh, several of these molds, or several of these, these uh, lens cradles for a mold. Um, and afterwards, it, I was able to resell the, the uh, wood lathe and get my money back. So it, it's, it's a very inexpensive way. If you don't want to go through that hassle, you can go to some uh, cake supply stores and baking goods stores. They actually have some, some tins that uh, you could cut out the middle and use the lens cradle over your uh, uh, housing. Uh, alternately, you could also use another method I've used before on other housings. I didn't even use a lens cradle. I just attached the, the lens or latch keeper to the lens and um, it worked out pretty good. You do have one disadvantage is that there's not much room for, for uh, error. You have to get your lens on perfectly. If you're attaching your lens to your housing by putting latch keepers here they have to be on perfectly because at very shallow water depth the only thing that's holding in the o-ring and keeping the water out is the pressure from your latches so if you make any error you're going to get seepage with this method when you have the lens cradle if you do ever have any seepage you can add uh, you can add a shim by putting some neoprene on and or or an o-ring on the inside so you increase the pressure. If it ever happens to you out in the field you can also take off your latch keeper from your lens cradle and you can you can pound down this after you remove it from the lens cradle you can pound down this piece here so it's up higher and it exerts more force when you you shut your uh, your latch. So this is how you make 
your lens cradle. It's made out of uh, fiberglass resin, polyester resin, from a mold that you make with pora mold, which is one part to one part. You can get this on the internet or craft supply houses. When you're done, you have a mold just like this that you can use hundreds of times. Um, you take your, your uh, this is what it's going to look like. If you don't add colorant, this is what it's going to look at like. When you, when you remove it from your mold, and it's going to be a little rough, if, you're, if your mold is a little rough, just smooth off your edges with a half round and add your little latch keepers equidistant from each other on, on your lens cradle. You could add four instead of three if, if you like, but I really had no problem with three. Um, and, and that's how you make your lens cradles. And like I said, you can also purchase other material if you don't want to make a lens cradle. Uh, you'd have to, like I said, there's some cake pins that are a little bit bigger than this. You could cut out the center and you could use on your housing. Or you could just attach directly to your lens. You'd have to drill some holes and put your latch keepers on your lens edges. And it's a little bit tricky, but it, I've done it successfully. And finally, don't forget to add your little strips of fiberglass. Get the chop strand. When I had the cloth, it just made too many air bubbles. I, I use this chop strand and small strips, like large band-aids, and put them in, and then press it down so the little hairs aren't sticking up, and just add the resin, it'll vibrate a little bit, let it set, and when you're done, you have a very sturdy uh, lens cradle. So that's how you make your lens cradle. Hello everybody, let's talk about the lenses for a moment. You're going to be using acrylic. This is a 3 8 inch thick acrylic lens. This is for the front. There's no holes in it. This is an old scrap piece, a little scratched up. This is not something I'd use new. But it has 12 holes equidistant from each other. They grow on the perimeter. And they're attached in the rear of the housing. And you're going to be using wood screws. These are 3 quarter inch stainless steel oval head. Uh, they're number 4, I think. Let's see if I can get a close up. These are wood screws. They make a very nice bite into the, the PVC. You have 12 of them all around. And using polyurethane sealant, 3M 5200 is the brand. It's the Fast Cure. Uh, it's the best material I found out there for this sealant, the, uh, the, the rear of the lens. Um, <clears throat> I, I can't stress enough how important it is to get the, the, the ends of your, your housing completely perfectly level and flat. Um, there's no possibility of any variation or wiggle room. These have to be perfectly level, perfectly flat. You could have a little bit of roughness like uh, scratches that would hold the, the polyurethane. Uh, like I don't necessarily sand my rear so it's perfectly smooth. If there's like little, little scratches, that's going to uh, uh, hold the polyurethane. If it's, it's minor scratches, um, you don't have to get it perfectly smooth, but it has to be perfectly level. Um, same thing for the front, because you're going to be putting a groove in it, and you're going to put your O-ring in there. There's no, there's no other way. It has to be perfect, at perfect level. We'll go into this. When we make the, this part, I'll show you. But that's going to go on the rear, 3 8 of inch thick acrylic. Some people say, why don't you use glass? Well, glass is a lot harder to come by. Um, also, this is not that easy to cut. At least, I found it kind of difficult. You can use a jigsaw. You can use a bandsaw. There are attachments you can use with power tools like table saws to cut circles. I think Rockwell has a new tool out. It's called a Blade Runner. I saw they had a, a little uh, circle cutter. But I found it was, since I'm making a lot of these, I found it a lot simpler just to have the plastic supplier cut these and drill the holes for me. Um, it was a lot simpler. Uh, like I said, you can do it. You can even put uh, your, your blank, if you describe your circle, and into a, a vise with pads. And you can use a, a coping saw by hand if, you're, if you go slowly. And when you're done, you can smooth the edges out. So you can do it by hand if you want. If you're just making one or even two. If you're making a lot, you need to use a power tool. Um, and like I said, your edges have to be perfectly smooth. And if you're making a, a camera to go deeper, you can also use a thicker lens. But 3.8 has worked fine for me. Now, a, a few minutes ago, we talked about how some people may not want to make a lens cradle for the front. And you could add your keepers on the edges like this. And I'll show you what I've done. This is an older design. I don't make and sell anymore. It's, it has the, this is the front lens. And you can see the, 
latch keepers on the edges. So there's no cradle for this design. So you can you can not use a lens cradle if you don't want to, but I do recommend it because it gives you more possibilities and it protects the lens better. Okay, we're going to be adding our latches and uh, to the lens cradle. Um, this is a, a fiberglass lens cradle that we made with a mold. Um, it's going to go on top. There's a minor bubble imperfection here, but that, that's not going to hurt it. Um, there isn't a lot of wobble, so it's fairly level. It lays down pretty flat. We have a fresh lens and a fresh O-ring. We have our groove. That should be perfectly level. It shouldn't be deeper here or higher here. It should be the same level all the way around. And one way you can check that is you can take a penny. If you take a nickel, it's going to be too high, and a dime, it's going to be too low. But a penny is just about right. I'll give you the dimensions later, so in case you don't have a penny in, in where you're at. You might be in a different country. Uh, if, if it just barely touches, that's, that's what you want. If it doesn't touch at all, but it's real close, that's okay. But if you push it, and it dislodges the, the, the lens up, if it lifts it up, then, then you know it's up too high. Right now, I, I can feel almost no drag, and I can't really feel any, any, uh, any play in it as I go around. You, you, can, you also want to put it up and eyeball it. And basically, this is going to give us the same dimension across the entire circumference to make sure we did a good job. Um, like I said, now you've got your, your lens on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add our latch keepers. Where are those little devils? We're going to add three of these to our housing. We're going to bend them and put them equidistant around the lens cradle. Let's do that right now. Okay, I've bent these with the pliers and they fit really good and we're going to be attaching right to the bottom lip of the housing uh, lens cradle. Okay we use a I think it's a 1 8 inch uh, drill bit and we're going to be adding in our little screws now. This is supposed to ratchet. If you drill your hole too small, you're going to crack your your lens cradle. The fiberglass is a little bit brittle. If you drill it too big, then your, your uh, screws aren't going to hold. So you want to experiment. Make sure you use the right one for the screw you're using. Like I said, I'm using uh, 6 by 3 8 sheet metal screw, stainless steel. trying to get these in the camera so there we go pretty snug okay we uh, added our latch keepers to our lens cradle and uh, I know you're supposed to put them equidistance between each other but if you're like me you, you may not have <laughs> measured right <laughs> and they may be a little off so what you're going to do is just pick one to be the bottom Whichever one looks the best for you, I think we're going to use this one right here. And just put a letter on the bottom. And then we're going to open up our housing. And let's put a mounting board in here. So we can kind of get an idea where the exact bottom is and line up our bottom with that. You can see that looks that looks about right. Let's see. Okay, so this is where we want to have our uh, our bottom latch. Of course, we took the lens off, and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure we have our gasket in and our lens. We'll look down on top. Okay. 
Okay. That looks about right. Now we're going to take, like I said, we we changed the drill bit in our drill. We used a uh, eighth of an inch to drill these holes, but now we're going to be putting in small potted holes, and we're using a uh, a different drill bit. You can use uh, like a three thirty second, but I like to use even smaller. I'm using the uh, five sixty fourth. I, I apologize to all my metric friends. <laughs> I'll give the conversion on the screen if I can. And we put a little piece of tape on here because the wall of the housing is about a little over half inch or excuse me, a little tiny bit under half inch. So we made a piece of tape and there's a quarter inch to play with there. We're going to be using this to drill our pilot hole for our screws. And this is kind of tricky because if you take a look at these latches, they're locking and this particular key moves it up and down. And you want to get it right about even. Like imagine this is a clock hand, you want to get it right around 12. That's how far you want to pull it down at least with, with this particular latch. If you have to use a different latch, you might have to experiment. But with these latches, with the number I gave you, if you purchase these latches, it works to, to go just to right about there. Then we're going to put these on and add one screw, tighten it up, and then do the same thing on the other two uh, latches, or latch keepers. So let's get started. Okay, if we're happy where that lens is, the le that uh, latches right about there. Make our mark. Now take our drill. Line her up. And we're going to stop right where the tape stops us. Take our screw and our latch Sorry, there's no background music while you're watching this. Okay. Put our sheet metal screw in there. <laughs> and tighten her up. There we go. Now. We're not going to tighten this, we're just going to snug it up just a little bit. We don't want to depress this lens cradle. We just want to keep this from moving. Because now we're going to tilt, or excuse, rotate this. Do the same thing on the next two. Take our latches off, and like I said, line them up right around 12 o'clock. If we get down too far, it's going to have a lot of pressure on our lens cradle and break it. If it's too loose, you're going to have leakage. Got some room to play with there. Make our little... I moved it down, didn't I? Shoot. Yeah, take a look. Make sure you're lined up. Okay. Pencils work better than pens on this particular project. Make our pilot hole. That grabs it real nice. Not too big, not too small. Okay, one more to go. Now make sure they're lined up nice. And our latches are working real smooth. You can put a little lubricant on them, some graphite. Now, let's 
good to have a reversible drill that you have a, a speed control on it so you can control your speed. It's a really handy drill to have. And I wouldn't go anywhere without my ratchet screwdriver from Sears. <laughs> If it breaks, you can take it back. My brother-in-law had a breaker bar and he broke it, took it back. He said, how did you break a breaker bar? <laughs> they didn't know my brother-in-law. <laughs> okay, here we go. Now, this is the moment of truth. Tighten that up, tighten that up. Yeah, that's sweet. It's not too tight, not too loose, real firm. Okay. Make sure they're on even. And we'll go and put the second screw in. And I'm going to turn the camera off while I do that. You guys don't need to watch every hole being drilled. Okay, everybody. We've got our latches on, both screws. And it tightens down real nice. I'm checking the alignment. They're lined really nice. This is on straight. This is on. This could have been over just a hair. That's on perfect. If you don't get it on completely level, you have a little bit of room to play with. I shouldn't say level, but if it's if it's off to one side or the other, you have a tiny bit of room to play with. So it's not a big deal. You have a little wiggle room. Now you can see you've got them lined up. We're going to be putting our uh, shim for the mounting plate on top here and then our arms. But first we're going to be putting on our rear lens because I like to put on our rear lens and see if we get any leakage and then we're going to go to our uh, our arms. Okay so let's put on our rear lens now. Okay we're going to be putting on our rear lens now. The most important part about this is you've made perfectly uh, sure that this is level. You've held it up to your eye and looked and seen that there was no light or gaps or anywhere and it's perfectly smooth and level. Um, we're going to be using a uh, our small drill bit again. The uh, You can use the 564 or the, the uh, 332nd. But make sure it's, it's uh, on. Uh, perfectly level and straight. Make two pilot holes. First one. We're using our three-quarter inch stainless steel uh, wood screws, oval head. Get in there. It's real easy for your your uh, screwdriver to slip and and slide across your lens and put a nice big gouge in it. Uh, you can tell people it's some sort of level for your camera. <laughs> uh, whatever you want, it's still you screwed up your lens. It's a very un, unpleasant situation. Okay, now you put this one in. It's straight. You can feel with your fingers. There's no overlap. Sometimes you'll get these pieces of pipe and they'll be squashed on one end so there's there's no way you can get it completely round because part of it will stick out and that's not really a piece of pipe you want to use. It should be completely round. You can see we're going all the way in. After we do this we're going to be uh, making a mark to see where these two went and then drilling the pilot holes for the other ten. Okay, I'm going to drill holes. I'll, I'll do first one, then I'll turn the camera off. And you'll get the idea. Okay. Okay, I've drilled the other holes. We're going to make two marks, or two sets of marks and make some sort of different type of mark or different amount over here. This is going to help us. So I've got four on that side, three on this side. 
let's just put one here. So when we lay this back down, we're going to be able to have marks to help us tell right where it went. These should be equidistant, but just in case they're not, these should line back up. So let's remove these two screws. Okay, we removed the screws. Let's put this someplace nice and safe. And you can see we have some uh, parts sticking up. We're going to take our razor blade and cut these guys off so they don't interfere. Now comes the fun part. My 3M5200, even though I put plastic over the top and sealed up tight, it's about three months old uh, and it's sealed up tied up here. So I'm going to have to make a cut. We're going to put 3M5200, make a band like like a fishing worm. That's about as thick as a fishing worm. We don't want too much or too little. It's going to go all the way around. So let's cut this off. Well, you should also have some uh, paper towels handy because 3M5200 has a way of getting over everything. Once that dries, the one that went inside, we can peel it off. Okay. Put her down here. Now, this part, you might have some little pieces of, of PVC stuck up in your hole, so take a little wire or something to pop them out because they're going to interfere with your screws when you put your screws in. In fact, you can use a screw to pop them out. That's another thing. You don't want your holes so small that when you put your screws in, they uh, put pressure on your lens. You want the holes just a tiny bit bigger than your screws because this lens is going to be under a lot of pressure constantly. It's going to flex back and forth when you're underwater. Over time, it could build up stress fractures. So you don't want that to happen. Now look what I just did. My goodness. Throw that away. So um, we have all our holes cleaned. Now we're going to line up our our marks that we made. Because see, we have the two ones we made with the pilot hole, and we drilled all the way down. This is my favorite part. There we go on that side. And did someone mention paper towels? <laughs> okay, let's see how we look over here on this side. Yep, the screw's going in. This screw's going in, so we lined it up okay. So now we're going to take... You don't have to hurry fast because this takes a while to cure. You have, And if you did make a mistake, you could actually remove this clean everything off with about 500 paper towels and start over. Also, if you get any bit on your fingers, you will eventually get it on your lens. So make sure your fingers are clean. And this should be in a ventilated area because even though you can't smell the 3 empty 200 very well, the vapors aren't good for you. And obviously you want to wear your eye protection and so forth. I say obviously, until you've seen somebody lose their eye with a wire wheel with a little piece of wire come off and blind them <laughs> and they were singing happy tune one second before, you don't realize how important your eye protection is. Okay, so you're going to tighten these down a little bit at a time. You're not going to go 100% on one, 100% on another. Just like you're tightening lug nuts on a car. And this is one of my favorite parts. Because if you did it right, it's just real sweet. It's all nice and level, and it's flat, and you know it's going to last for a hundred years. And because we left some little scratches and imperfections in the rear of the lens, or excuse me, the rear of, of the housing, when the lens presses down, it's going to squeeze out that uh, 3 200 so much 
there's just going to be a thin smear and you're actually going to see uh, the lens pressed up against the, uh, the cradle. The little markings are going to come through. And all of that 3M5200 that got squeezed out the side, we're going to uh, press it down with a paper or a piece of cardboard and then put the neoprene on the outside. This is going to take a few minutes. Okay, we're about to just put on the last bit of tightness here. You can see the, uh, the marks on the housing are starting to show up in the lens, so you can tell that's pressing down as far as it can go. You can't weld this, but you want to get it as close to being welded shut as you can. If you didn't level out your housing, you're going to hear all sorts of snap, crackle, and pop. One of your pieces is going to be higher than the other, and you're going to have a leak. Okay, that's about done. Now you can see the marks that are coming through now little tiny machine marks. Ah. I've never actually broken the head off, but I have stripped them. It seems to go better when you make a sound. <laughs> Alrighty, that's about it. What the heck. And you have a nice bead coming around the outside. We're going to take something like a little piece of cardboard or not. Where's our razor blade? Here we go. Take a little piece of cardboard and smooth out that little bit of... Angle it up. Don't angle it down so it works up toward the top. Want to flatten that out. If you get any on your lens or your housing in a place you don't want, you never want one on your lens, but if you get on your housing, uh, this is the time you want to get it off with paper towels. Okay. Now, this is our neoprene. It's about 22 and a quarter inches. It's one eighth of an inch thick. It's two inches wide. And it's very inexpensive and it makes a really nice cosmetic uh, look to the housing. Here's the, the bottom, so when we're done, we want to have the seam line up with the bottom. So let's see what we can do. Alrighty. Oh my goodness. Live on television. Okay. We're going to line this up. So when this overlap will come right on the bottom. So the center of that lap would be right about where this screw is. So we want this one to start right about here. And we're going to go right up to the top edge. You'll see in one second. Take the paper off. Have it on something so the housing can slide because you're going to rotate it. Bring it right up to the top edge. Now, start folding her down. Not too high so it's up over the top. Not too low. If you make a mess, you can put on another piece of neoprene and start over. Okay. Now. And we lined up right with that center. Center screw right there.
take your hands. Try not to get it in the white devil. <laughs> there we go. Now here's a little trick. Sometimes this comes back off later. It doesn't glue right. You can take that excess. You just pour it off. Well, we can use the one that was on this razor blade. Just put a tiny bit on there. And help seal it up. Use what you got. Nope, one more time. Do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> oh, look what he did. Okay, we can take that off when it hardens. Okay, well now you have on your uh, lens, rear lens, you have on your neoprene, and just about the only thing left is to make your arms and your shim, and you're pretty close to being done. This is one of my favorite parts, because you can see it all starting to come together here. See there? This is starting to look a lot nicer, isn't it? Okay, let this dry. Okay, when I first started making these, I, I was fixated on the idea that in order to make these, I had to cut this perfectly straight. Uh, I, I did have to have a perfectly flat and level surface when I was done, but cutting it was not the way to go. Um, but I tried a dozen different ways. This is something I used, a little box I made, and I would put the saw here. I'd have long pieces. I, since I was making a lot of these, I'd buy 20-foot uh, sections of pipe and I'd cut them into either 6 or 10 or 12 inch lengths depending on what size I needed and I'd use this little this little box and I put the bolts here after you put imagine this was a long pipe and four inch sections or excuse me four foot sections I'd put it in here and I'd cut it off right here with this little slot and when I was done it still would be uneven so what I learned eventually and this is where I think you're going to be saving a lot of time because it took me a long time to figure this out is you don't worry so much about cutting it perfectly straight. After you cut it with whatever method you're going to use, use a router to level it off and the router to make a groove. But I still end up using this box because if I have a source section, I can use the box and put it on the end and I can still lock it down. And what I use is a saw saw, a reciprocating saw, to cut it. And just use the wood as the guide and just bring it down. Now, if you don't have a box and you just have a short piece like Let's say you go to a plumber supply house and they have a scrap piece you can get. Hopefully that's what you can do because you can't really afford to buy a 20 foot section if you're only making one or two of these housings. But I'm sure you can go to a plumber or supply house and get a small section if you're offering to give them a few dollars a foot because it costs close to ten dollars a foot. So here's your piece. Let's say you got a small piece. You can make a perfectly level, uh, get a piece of paper, wrap it around and make a mark on, on your pipe and you can lay it down on, on the uh, driveway or flat surface and you can use your, your saw saw to cut and as you cut it's going to roll. You, you can control the saw and when you're done you're going to have it won't be even but it'll be fairly even and you can then use your router to level off your, uh, your ends. And this is the secret to making these with the well casing. Don't try to cut these perfect. I used initially a uh, rotating uh, drill press bed with a cutter I used a, <laughs> a, uh, a wood lathe and it almost killed me. Um, I used so many different things and it was so hard to get them level. What you do is, is don't worry about cutting it straight and level. Cut it and then make it level with your router and we'll be showing you how to do that. Like I said, you don't need this box but it did come in handy and if you're making a piece with a, um, a four or five foot section, a little box will help you will cut them straight and hold it for you. This is your uh, jig you're going to be using to level off the ends of your pipe. And if you don't level off the ends of your pipe perfectly, nothing else matters. It's the most important thing to do. This jig is very simple and unsophisticated. Um, it's just a piece of wood on, on the bottom that you've cut out a hole. That's just a hair bigger, maybe a sixteenth of an inch bigger than your pipe. After you have this cut, you're going to take pieces of wood and level off and make a box to hold your pipe. And if you look closely, it's uh, even with the hole on the bottom here, 
on the bottom here and on the bottom here and up on top here. So it's on, not on four sides on the bottom. It's three sides on the bottom and one side on the top it's level. That allows you to get your pipe in e e evenly. Uh, once you do that, you're going to line up your box with your router table. This is a half inch router bit flat and I've made marks on my router table and this says the front so you're going to put your box on and when you have everything lined up and you put your um, your uh, housing inside if your housing is a little bit uh, longer and uneven as you turn this it's going to knock off the uneven parts until eventually everything's smooth. You just want like a, a 16th or 32nd of an inch at the end to, to where you're just taking off tiny bits. Eventually you can even knock it down even smaller to where when you're done it's so smooth you hardly even need to use any sandpaper. So let, let's take a look inside. Let's see if we can get a close up. This is where your, your, uh, your housing is going to go around and it's going to be cut off on that router bit right down there. And you're touching with the walls there and there and there and also touching right here to lock it in and keep it uh, nice and smooth. When you make your uh, jig it should be very tight and then you could take a little sandpaper and knock off the high parts so you can rotate your housing. You can also use PAM or WD-40 to help lubricate as you're turning. But this should be perfectly square, perfectly even. You can use a little uh, square to make sure your, your sides are all level when you assemble with your screws. And while you're cutting your pipe, you can use a uh, paintbrush to knock out your pieces of dust. I like to use these large C-clamps to hold my jig in place. And when I do cut, I, I cut very small increments. Um, if I made a mistake in cutting my pipe and it's very jagged and I have to take off a lot of material, I still only take off a little bit at a time. And at the end, I, I make an adjustment when I'm close to getting to where it's perfect level and I'm taking off just paper thin sheet uh, thicknesses at a time. And when you're done, you shouldn't have to even do any sanding. But um, you, if you do have to do any sanding, you can use a wet dry sandpaper and just rotate it and it'll, it'll remove any final imperfections. I like to put my routers in a box, uh, that way I can control the dust, and on the bottom of the box I have a small PVC pipe I can attach my vacuum hose, and I put a piece of cardboard on the top of the box when I'm doing my routing, and I can eliminate most of my dust that way. This is the Ryobi router that I use to cut the grooves and the uh, camera housings. And this is the jig you're going to be using. It's very simple, unsophisticated jig, but I've used it to make hundreds of, of housings. It's a thin sheet of 1 8 inch uh, masonite. And you're going to take a piece of pipe that you've flattened the level of the ends on, and you're going to put it on your piece of masonite, draw a perimeter on the outside on the inside to denote the diameter of your housing on the piece of masonite. Then you're going to take scraps of wood and put them on the outside and inside perimeter to, to lock your piece of pipe in place. I removed these pieces so you could see what's happening a lot easier. This is with hot glue so you can you can put it on and off pretty easily. Um, once you have drawn your circles on the inside and outside and put your pieces of, of wood, you're going to remove your pipe then you're going to drill a hole dead center in the uh, piece of uh, masonite where you've drawn your outside and inside perimeter dead center in the middle with a tiny little drill uh, bit and as a pilot hole. Then you're going to take a quarter inch drill bit and drill a hole dead center and that's going to match the size of your quarter inch router bit. And once you've done that you've pretty much made your jig because you're going to have your pieces out on the outside and when you put your uh, piece of housing inside and you turn it while the uh, router is on you're going to be drilling or excuse me routing your groove in the ends of your pipe. And that's about all there is to it. Uh, let, me, let me see if we can show you a close-up. This is 
your uh, groove, you can take a piece of wet dry sandpaper and smooth out the little imperfections. And that's how you make your jig. Okay, this is how you make your groove for your uh, ballast tubes. This is a two and one eighth of an inch long uh, groove or slot. It's half inch thick. That way your uh, little arms can fit inside your ballast tubes. This is going to be your ballast tube. In order to make this, I made a little uh, jig. This is a masonite, and these are one by twos. And this is where your router uh, head is going to come out, just enough to cut this. You don't want it up too high. And I made uh, two one by twos parallel to the, the groove. And I put a piece of tape to mark. You're going to have to fiddle with it to get it to where you want it. And you put the um, uh, PVC pipe right in your jig, right about where the tape is. And then just slide it along until it hits the stopper. And then you can lift up and you'll have a groove cut into your PVC. Now this can get away from you. It can slide and go across the room against the wall. So I put this here. Be careful. Make sure you got eye protection on, ear protection, and you'll have anybody walking around. They can get knocked in the head with this. <laughs> but when you're done, you have a perfectly even slot. Let's talk about mounting your camera. Your camera is going to be on a, a little piece of um, masonite. When I first started making these, I used solid aluminum uh, plate, and uh, it would stop a train. And I said, what am I doing? Because y if you're out in the field and you need to use a different camera, you're going to have to drill a different hole. And it's hard to drill aluminum when you're <laughs> on an island someplace. <laughs> uh, but this you can use your pen knife and make a hole. This is a quarter inch uh, brass bolt. And you, like I said, it's one eighth thick, very, very, uh, very lightweight, very flimsy actually. It's, it's the least robust material of the whole housing. But it's like I said, it's, it's made that way on purpose so you can make holes when you need to. It does its job very well. It slides under your little uh, uh, washers. These are washers I bend and add a big gobs of hot glue with a large hot glue. Don't use the small glue guns, use the big one. And add enough glue to where you're going to get burned. <laughs> That's what you're going to be doing. You're adding glue to your washers and put a little paint over. I don't add paint on the inside. I used to do that to reduce reflective uh, surfaces on, on your lens, but since this is pretty dull and matte black anyway, I stopped doing it because the paint was coming off and it was interfering uh, with, with uh, the operation of the housing. So I, I left this unpainted, except I did put some paint on the washers just a little bit to make them look better and reduce reflective surfaces. So that's how you make your little, like I said, this is, I think this is three inches. Yes, three inches. And it's a little bit short of the total length because, believe it or not, your lens does get pressed in a bit. And if you're right up against the lens, it's going to leave a mark on your lens when you're down deep. So that's your uh, mounting plate for your camera. Very simple. If any of these pop off, you can use a glue gun to put them right back on. Some people have used 3M, uh, excuse me, uh, JB Weld to put on their washers, but I I've never seen the need to. Um, the only drawback is if you're flying somewhere and this is in luggage and it gets cold up there in the upper atmosphere, if it freezes, you can have it flex and your washers could pop off. <laughs> uh, uh, we have found that out. We couldn't understand why these things were coming off sometimes and that's what was happening. Um, but like I said, they're easy to replace and it's something that it's not a big issue if it's out in the field and one of them is off. You could, you could jury rig something. It's not a, a critical component. How to make the uh, the mounting shim? The mounting shim is a little piece of fiberglass that has a flat surface that allows the top plate to be screwed into and, and give a flat surface. You make it by um, taking some clay and making a little box and putting clay in to make something that looks like this. Imagine there's a little box around here and you press clay in and remove the box. When you're done, you have something like this that's clay, and you use this to make your rubber mold. You put the clay form in and you put the rubber 
mold material around it and when you're done you're able to reproduce these endlessly. Now they are a little rough and what you're going to be doing whenever you sand anything try to use wet dry sandpaper and make sure it's wet and moist you eliminate all of your dust. You don't want to breathe anything if you don't have to. Um, so to, to uh, smooth down the flat part you just rub it on the flat surface and to get this part to where it fits evenly you put your wet dry sandpaper on, on your, uh, your housing piece and you just rub it until it fits perfectly. You want this to be as snug and, and uh, form fitting as possible because when you're adding your screws you don't want a, a space raised up you want flat and flush because you have very little tolerance when you add your screws. This is a very critical part because you have almost no room to play with here and you want to attach this permanently and you don't want to go through the housing wall. So this is a critical piece. Uh, I'll give you the dimensions in a bit on the screen. Uh, like I said, this is really easy to make and when you're done you'll be able to put your mounting arm on top. Working with fiberglass I found it's very easy to use a scale, a digital scale, and I just add simple polyester resin at 12 drops of the hardener. I think that the instructions tell you to add more, but I add less so it sets up a little less quickly. And you add 12 drops of this to one ounce of your resin. And I use these sherbet cups. It's a uh, uh, type of plastic that it's easy to get your fiberglass back out. You can reuse these cups over and over once your fiberglass hardens because it doesn't stick to this. So it's very easy. Also something else, you make a lot of bubbles when you use a flat stick. If you get a, a, a metal rod or a spoon or something with a handle, bend it flat and you stir it this way on the bottom, you're stirring in your resin hardener very well but you're not making bubbles. And it's a, it's a very good way to stir up your fiberglass. When you're done, pour it in your mold and, and 10 minutes later you have a, uh, a shim. So that's how you make your shims for your housing. And you don't need to put any fiberglass uh, cloth in it. It, it. Because it's being compressed, there's no other forces on it. It works very well without the fiberglass reinforcement of the cloth. So you don't need to add colorant either. And basically that's it. That's how to work with your fiberglass and to make your shims. When I first started making the housings, I made a design that this part could come off and dismantle and you would have a much smaller housing. Um, but I never could find a way to attach the top piece without eventually wobbling and jiggling. So what I did is I changed my whole design theory and I tried to make this as permanent and dislodgeable, <laughs> if that's a word, <laughs> impossible to remove as possible. Um, and just made these uh, removable. This part. Uh, doesn't come off. It's permanent and these parts can. This part is made out of a seaboard. It's a half inch thick. Like I said before, it's a wonderful material. Uh, let me show you really quick. This is what you get or what you're going to make. You're going to have three pieces. This is the top mount. This is a side arm. This is another side arm. And they slide in. Get in there. <laughs> and you're going to be attaching them with uh, half inch aluminum. I cut these uh, with a jigsaw. I cut halfway through and then bend them back and forth till they snap and take a file and smooth them down. And I put the holes in. When you make your holes, make sure they're close to the edge. If they're too far in toward the, the center, it'll be hard to put the nuts on because they'll interfere with each other. And you want them so they fit right there. But that's how they're attached. And you put the bolts on, the stainless steel bolts, and when you're done you have a very solid arms and top mount. The arms go into a PVC. I'll show you how to cut this. This is one and a quarter inch PVC and you're making a slot with your router and you're putting your arm in there and you're going to put two stainless steel bolts here and attach it and you put on end caps. So when you're done like this you put a little screw here and a screw here so they don't pop off and if you open these up you can add lead weights to make your ballast and that'll help you to submerge or get neutral 
uh, or positive, whatever type of buoyancy you want for your camera, what's good for you. I like slightly positive buoyancy. But put your lead weights in here. A lot of people just attach lead weights to the, the pipe. They don't put the lead weights inside, but whatever your preference, this is, this is something I made so you can put weights inside. Um, the top piece of your uh, arms is where you're going to be attaching your, uh, your shim. This is the shim that goes to your uh, your housing, and I made a jig. What I do is that way I always have the same holes. I made a little jig. You have four holes. You can ignore the center hole, and that'll make your four holes. And then you put your jig over. If you're just going to be making one, you can just measure, and that way you're going to have your screws line up. And your screws are going to look like this. First of all, this part is going to have two holes, and you're going to be using uh, three quarter inch stainless steel screws to lock them down. Once you lock these down, you're going to add the uh, polyurethane 3M5200 also and then you're going to add your top plate on top and you're going to be adding screws. These are one and a quarter inch stainless into the four holes and they're going to go in almost like two-thirds of the way through your housing and they're going to lock into your housing. So this is going to be very snug. On the sides you have the stainless steel bolts and you have stainless steel bolts down here and this secures your ballast tube and it secures your sidearms which can be removed. And so basically that's it. That's how to make your sidearms. You can cut these on a bandsaw or you can use a handsaw, jigsaw. This, the, the main, the most important part for this is this is I think eight and a half inches. Yeah, this, this measurement between these two edges is eight and one half inches. And this is half inch wide slot. And once you make that slot, if you make a corresponding slot, that's also one half inch and it's parallel to your surface or your plane, it'll go right in. So that's how you make that's how you make your uh, your arms and your mounting arm on top. And it's made out of seaboard. You could make this out of another material, but I wouldn't risk it. You could you could purchase a small amount at a plastic supply company for a very small amount, and you'd have the best material in the world that you could use to make this. When you've made your groove in the top of your housing, and it's perfectly level, the best way to check is to eyeball it. Just put it up to your eye, and look, and you shouldn't see any space or any light between your lens and your housing. It should be completely flat, smooth, and flush. The depth that you want your groove to be in the top of your housing should be one half the diameter of the thickness of your O-ring. So when you place your O-ring on top and you put your lens, the distance between the lens and the top of your housing should be one half of the diameter of your O-ring. We talked about this before. A penny just about cuts it. If you rotate it, you can see it's just barely touching. It's not pushing up anywhere. Okay, it's just barely touching all the way around. There should be very little difference in any of the places you put it. You don't want it higher on one side and lower on another. Okay, I'm going to try to get some close-ups. This is a close-up of the, uh, the groove and the O-ring. you still got a little bit of sheen, machine marks that you can take out with uh, wet-dry sandpaper but it gives you a good idea what it looks like when you're done with your router.
you want to make sure your shim is very level and, and flush and fits on your your top arm and you want to make sure the screws line up before you put them onto your housing and you can see let me see it get a close-up you can see you don't have much to play with this is how much screws take out into your housing um, and like I said line it up make sure it fits flush before you put it onto your housing now this is an example of one uh, this is where your holes are going to be however the holes are much too large here and you want the screws to be flush you want the screws to be flush but these are, are far too deep so this is just this is an example this is an example of one you don't want to use okay this is what we want our our, our little shim to look like and you can see the screws are going to fit flush right on top of your shim these are the four holes you're going to have into your your top arm and these are the holes that you're going to use the screw to secure the shim to the housing okay what we've done is added the two screws to the top and make sure that they're going to go in okay and we're getting ready to add a 3M5200 now this 3M5200 is not going to secure this these two screws will secure this shim and once you add these two screws in you can you can't get it off with a hammer it's going to be on there it's solid what this 3M5200 is going to do, it's going to act like a little cartilage in your bone. It's going to give it a shock absorber. It is, if you get your arms hit, it's going to keep this for, from, from being knocked loose because it's going to give just a tiny bit. Also, your 3M5200 is going to be forced up into these screw holes. So when these screws go down inside those holes into your housing, not very much is going to go into your housing. You don't have very much because you have almost nothing to play with here you don't, and you don't want to go through the wall. So the 3M5200, once it goes in those little holes, is going to grab onto your screws and, and set up hard and, and it's going to grab on so these screws are less likely to come out. Um, I've never had them come out and, and, and over 300 housings in four years of making them. But that's why you're using the 3M5200. Not to secure this shim, those screws secure it. That 5200 is going to act like a little shock absorber and it's going to grab onto your screws. So let's go ahead and do that. We, uh, we made a mark just in case something happens, we can put our, our shim back on. We, we looked inside our holes to make sure we have a pilot hole to line up. This was a little crack here because this is very fragile, but th that's not going to be a problem at all. It's just a surface crack right there, blemish. Alrighty. And we lined it up level with our bubbles, so we know we're going to be right on top. You can take a razor blade. And, and cut down on that part. You don't want to add too much because it's going to score it out the side, but you want to see if you can put on enough so where it will uh, go up those holes. Paper towel. Now, put your screws. Line yourself back up. Alrighty. Now once you put these screws in here, you won't be able to remove this shim if you hit it with a hammer. It's going to be on solid. Now, we'll put a little more over the screw, over that screw, a little bit there, a little bit there. Now, here comes a little trick. Now your screws are in your holes. Take a C-clamp and help it, let it help you do some of your work here. Put a piece of cardboard so you can protect your C-board because it will have an indentation if you don't. It'd be kind of ugly right there on top. Snug that C-clamp down tight. There you go. Now, this is the tricky part.
you can feel the screw starting to go in now. Because you put that C-clamp on there, it's backed it up. It'll bite into your housing. Yep. You're going to let this set for 24 hours before you do anything else with it. And you're going to look at it visually to make sure that your top arm here is flush with your shim. Sometimes it'll go in and it feels tight but it's what it's done is it's pushed or pulled up the, the top arm and it's not on you have a space you're going to have to look at it to make sure but you definitely want to use that clamp all right that's not getting a lot of traction there on that fourth one we'll take a look in a second that's tight that's very tight very tight. Now this one, not happy. Okay, it's tight, but not as tight as I would hoped. Okay. It's a little bit tight now. Okay, this worked out pretty good. You've got your four screws in. It's into the housing. It's through the shim. And you don't see any, <coughs> excuse me, spaces between your uh, your arm, top arm, or your, your uh, housing on either side, and it's flush. Your screws went in pretty good. This one wasn't as tight as I had hoped, but because the 3M5200 is in a hole, it's going to grab onto it, so it, this won't come off. Once you've attached your top arm and your shim to your housing, you're just going to be adding your uh, aluminum angle and your side arms and your ballast tubes. And on the bottom of the ballast tubes, I usually put a little screw here and a screw here to keep the, the, the caps from coming off easily. And I drill little holes in the ends of the ballast tubes to let the air bubbles come out. And if you put uh, lead weights, it's good to put them in a mesh bag or something. So if you have to go through customs and they want you to remove everything from the inside, you don't have everything laying all over the floor. You can just pull a bag out and then show them it's just lead weights because they get kind of concerned about that. Um, if you get a little bit of the uh, 3M5200 come out, it really doesn't look that bad. But if, if you don't like it, you can take an X-Acto knife, score it, and pull it off. And this dries up in about 24 hours. When you're out in the, in the water, and if you have these weights full of, uh, excuse me, ballast tubes full of weights in your camera inside, it's not really good to hold your, your housing by the arms because this acts as a lever for your arm. And theoretically, it could uh, uh, pull this apart. Otherwise, it's never happened. It's better to just hold your camera housing from the bottom. Or just to make a sling with a piece of rope or strap and carry it. And you want to take these arms and smooth down the edges. Because if you're out somewhere and, and you're carrying this for a long time, by the arm, which you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> it could uh, hurt your fingers. So you just want to smooth down the edges. Which is very easy to do with the, uh, with the starboard.
Hello everybody, let's talk about the paints and little odds and ends you're going to need to finish your video camera housing. For the outside of the housing, um, on the main body, I use a oil-based uh, Rust-Oleum. It's uh, an enamel and this particular color is sunburst yellow. I'm not going to tell you what color to paint your housing, that's a personal preference, but I kind of like this uh, paint I used to use, It's but you have to get it to mix vessel. It's not a standard color, it's, it's sort of a, a pumpkin, it goes very good with the black but it takes a while to get somebody to mix it for you. You can buy this right off the shelf. And I get this at the big box store, uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. My favorite hardware store is Ace. They're the most uh, helpful people when I go to any hardware store, even though they might be a dollar or two more extra. I, I, I save a lot of money by just going there and getting good information from the people, where at the other stores, you don't get that help. But you do have uh, the paint and the the Home Depot and so on, that is sold much more frequently, so it's much more fresher. So I do try to get my paint there. Um, and like I said, this is the Rust-Oleum enamel. I first put on a uh, primer after I sand a little bit. I put on the primer, one coat, bullseye, it's extremely good primer. Then I put on at least four coats of the enamel for the outside of the main body. Um, when you're painting, up here is the groove, you might want to put a little petroleum jelly so if you slop over some paint it, it doesn't go in the cracks and it's very hard to get out with uh, with sanding. Um, for the uh, ballast tubes I used a water based because no matter what I did eventually the ballast tubes would end up getting scratched. So it's harder to put on the oil base so what I do is I put on one coat of uh, the, the uh, primer and then I just put on one, actually two or three coats of this particular paint, it's uh, Bears Premium Plus. I've used over four different types of paint for the ballast tubes. This is very good paint. It's one of the best I've used. I recommend it highly. Um, you are still going to get scratches on your ballast tubes, but if you use a foam brush and, and use a water-based paint for your ballast tubes, when, when you're done, you can rinse out this brush and use it repeatedly many, many times. And then it only takes uh, a few seconds to uh, refurbish your ballast tubes once they've been painted. If they get scratched up, you can make them look like new again. Um, and like I said, I don't use, I use a brush for many things, but not for painting. It's good for, for getting dust out or when you're using your router to get out dust and uh, all sorts of other things, but, but not for the painting. What I use for painting is the, the, these brushes. And when you're doing your housing, you're going to leave a little bit unpainted so you can hold it with your fingers and then you can just use your hands and you don't get paint all over your hands. Um, and on this piece here where it's not painted, this is your bottom, and you're going to be putting your neoprene around the edge. So it doesn't matter that that little bit right there is unpainted. Um, for putting on your lens, you're going to use a polyurethane sealant. This is probably the best there is. It's a fast cure, uh, marine adhesive sealant by 3M, and it's really not that fast of a cure. <laughs> it takes a while for it to cure. Uh, but that doesn't matter. This is what you want to use. It, it doesn't get hard and brittle. It stays a little bit soft, so as your lens flexes with pressure or temperature, it doesn't break the seal. It's a really, really good thing to use. I recommend it highly. Um, for the outside, when you're done, just use a little armor all. It makes your housing look really nice and shiny. When you, if let's say you slop over and you get some paint on the top, don't sand. Never, never sand when you can scrape. Just use a uh, razor blade and just scrape off any parts of paint that you got on your lip. You don't want to be breathing dust when you don't have to, and you should never have to. Um, for your hot glue, I could not find my, my hot glue gun. <laughs> so this is an example of the one you do not want to get. This works, but it only dispenses a small amount of glue at a time. For our purposes, what we're going to be using the hot glue is to put on these little washers. You want large gobs. It'll, it'll get cold too quickly, and it won't make a good seal or a good uh, stick. Um, these are the large, large uh, pieces of uh, glue for your glue gun. And that's about it. And like I said, you can hold these by your hand if you leave this space here. And, and you can just paint them without without having to get painting all over. But if you're like me and you're, you're, you had to paint several hundred, 
just take the little toy from the thrift store and make yourself a lazy season and you can paint these because you're going to have to put on like I said one coat of primer and probably about four or maybe five coats of your oil base to get a nice uh, finish on your housing and when you're done you're going to have a hot body this is your latex paint here this is your oil base and there's your polyurethane 3 and 5200 ceiling and those are the adhesives and paints you're going to be using on your housing hello everybody thanks for watching my video it looks like we're about the end of the Nemo 200 um, for a long time I was reluctant to, to make this video I wasn't sure if anybody would be interested the, the Nemo 200 it's a, it's a wonderful camera housing it's, it's very sturdy it's extremely reliable but it looks pretty homemade um, it's not very fancy sophisticated also the methods I use to manufacture it um, I don't have a, a shop um, in fact <laughs> I made the first couple hundred of these things inside of an apartment over on Miami Beach so um, it's, it's not very uh, fancy uh, production values here either I'm not Steven Spielberg um, but I just wanted to, to, it took me a long time to figure out how to do this. And I wanted to show people that they could do it too. They could take off-the-shelf materials, fairly inexpensive materials, and using a few little tricks that took me a long time to figure out, they could end up having housing that they can go out, go diving, and bring back their, their uh, adventures and experiences to, to share with their friends and family. Um, it, it's, it's something I was, I was proud of, and I, I really think other people once they they make this they're going to be thrilled having something instead of spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on they can just spend a few dollars so if if I left something out and I'm sure I did <laughs> please go to nemohousing.com it was a little blog I have and I'm going to be adding a forum too so other people that uh, be the purchased or have purchased the housing or, or have purchased a video uh, on how to make the housing can can leave messages with me and other people and I hope you come and visit on the forum I have about three dozen uh, videos sent to me by customers who have purchased the camera housing in the past and uh, sent me videos that they, they, they made diving with the, the Nemo 200 um, hope to see your videos soon too um, w finally uh, I, I really want to say how much I appreciate you spending the time uh, to watch the video and if, if I can answer any questions or help in any way to help you get your, your housing made, I'll be happy to do it. Thanks again.